Hello everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to another live stream. We're kind of like our finale of this uh, series. We're going to be analyzing and discussing my recently published uh, master's project. Give me one moment while I pull up my live stream. There we go. And let me go and test my audio. Great, and muting. So today, let me also go ahead and do something real quick. Send another person a message. Uh, today we are gonna be going back and kind of finishing up the creative, uh, analyzing and discussing the creative work, uh, my creative uh, part of my. Uh, uh, master's project and if you want to find out uh, uh, If you want to find this and read it for yourself All you have to do is Google Chico State Scholar Works First option should be Merriam Library you click that Go into business Sco Chico Scholar Works and once you're in here you just search my name Zachary Bennett Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y-B-E-N-N-E-T-T -T. Search it, and the only option that should pop up is my novel project. This project actually got 31 views and 13 downloads since it was published. Not really as popular, but it is, uh, at least I, I really know like how popular these type of things are. Once again, like this does have like a publishing uh, warning, publication warning. Uh, it says that no project uh, may be reprinted or reproduced in any manner unacceptable to the usual copyright uh, restrictions without the written permission of the author. I am the author of this project, so I'm giving myself full permission to analyze and discuss this project as, as a whole. Today we are going to be reading the sections Hefe, Michael, Alec Lowe, and God. And let's just go ahead and try and find the Hefe section. After I read and discuss like, these four sections, I'm actually going to do something kind of different. Where I am actually going to, uh, is this Hefe? That is Elizabeth Hart. Uh, I'm actually going to, uh, this Hefe, yes. I'm actually going to uh, kind of show off like the prologue of my first book just to sort of like Okay, well, I am turning you off I'm gonna be reading the prologue of my first book uh, just to uh, Kind of like advertise it like before it's published just trying to get people's Attention of what my story is kind of like uh, But let's go ahead and get things started. Hefe Hefe sat in his chair, sensing something off in the area, but he couldn't figure out what. He thought he saw something move in his office, but as he looked around, he saw nothing. Hefe noticed the odd yet familiar smell of sage in the room, and as Hefe stood up for, uh, from his chair and walked around the room once more, he found nothing out of the ordinary. His brown, patchy brown... That's a typo? His brown patchy suit uh, hung loosely around his, on his frame, and his facial scar resembling a burn began to twitch sporadically. He ran his hands uh, through his disheveled, disheveled black hair as he scanned out of the room, again to detect anything out of the ordinary. His green eyes wandered to his large ornate desk, a painting of some unknown historical figure on the wall. And finally, go ahead and zoom in a little bit. And finally, to the numerous filing cabinets lining the wall near the exit. No matter where he looked, uh, he could not pinpoint the origin of the small sage, a scent that was growing stronger and stronger. F.A. approached a large wooden door with a number one on it, reached for the handle, and froze. Every hair on his body stood on end as his breathing was shallow. There was only one person in the world who could make him feel that way, but F.A. knew this was impossible. Before I go on, the reason why I kind of use the notion of sage is sage is a type of herb that is often used for warding off spirits in real life. Like a lot of people just kind of burn sage and just kind of bleed it through around this house in order to just try to ward off any spirits that may be haunting it. It's like a superstitious thing that a lot of people kind of use. No idea like if it's actual if it actually works. So the reason why I'm like using sage is just trying to give a call back to that 
uh, type of thing. Dylan, a voice all too familiar to his half face spoke up. That is your name. Hefe turned around, eyes wide in shock as he faced a man every resident of hell looked up to. Samael. Hefe's voice came out as a slight whisper. Samael, commonly referred to, referred to as names like Lucifer, Satan, and the Devil, had a lean, well-built frame. He was shirtless and only wore pants and shoes, but from his back sprung silver wings. He had long black hair that extended to his shoulders and dark brown eyes. He looked at uh, Hefe with a smile as if he was looking at his own son. Hefe began to get emotional. For the first time in a long time, he felt as if he was going to cry tears of joy. Samael was back. His Samael was back. Hefe felt like he didn't need to fight anymore. Somehow, somehow Samael had escaped captivity by the Hyde Agency, and he was back here to lead hell. Hefe wondered how long it had been since he last saw Samael, the true leader of hell. Hefe approached Samael. He wanted to embrace him, to touch him, at least to make sure he wasn't dreaming. However, if this was a dream, Hefe wasn't sure if he wanted to wake up. Every fiber of his being was telling him that this was really his Samael. He had somehow returned from his imprisonment. Deep, despite all this, deep down, some part of him was drawing some sort of familiarity from this, as if he had seen this type of thing before. So, my, before we go on any further, this is kind of like the first time in the series that you kind of see Samael shown. Uh, the way I have designed him is he's, I'm trying to like draw some parallels in his appearance uh, to uh, that of Jesus Christ. I just sort of like, sort of like a mocking of the uh, crazy thing that's often like attributed to uh, uh, the devil and like demonic entities. Uh, there's uh, like a superstitious belief that if you hear like a knock of three, like in like a supposedly haunted building, that's like a demon like mocking the Holy Trinity, and uh, that's kind of like, something that I kind of wanted to parallel. Like there's gonna be a lot of similar parallels to Samuel and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not gonna be like in the story. I'm gonna be focusing entirely on developing the character of God, rather than introducing like different versions of him, different people that represent him. Uh. He is going to be kind of one of the most interesting antagonists of this series, at least the most charismatic and the most eccentric. But you really will only see like a part of him, like, a, and you'll kind of see like what this mem memory is like in, uh, as we continue reading. You are the first of a new breed of demon I will call Neo Hominidae, the breed capable of walking amongst men, blending in perfectly, a wolf among sheep. Samuel stated enthusiastically. Hefe looked at Samuel confused, gears beginning to turn. I know. I think you said this before. Hefe? A female uh, voice spoke up, jolting Hefe back to reality. Damn it, Hefe swore. You shouldn't have gotten caught up in the moment. Executive override, codenamed Dylan, full system shutdown. Which is once a fancy uh, office space dropped his facade and revealed itself as an empty, barren, gray room connected to an adjacent room which was separated by a heavy steel door and a large pane of glass. Hefe looked over at where his desk was and wished he could have saved the half bottle of scotch he had left, even if it was an illusion. Hefe turned to look at the woman. She wore an outfit made of a combination of animal skins and bones. Her hair was braided and brown, while her face was painted white with what appeared to be some type of white powder. Thank you for the follow, da baby. uh... Uh, S.O. Really did appreciate it. Did the building try to affect you again? The woman asked, as a smirk forming on her face. Yes, Hefe groaned. This building has a mind of its own, but I'm not willing to leave this place yet. It is too important to me. Hefe looked around the now barren room and was reminded of the good old days. The days when hell was run by Samuel, the days there was order, and the days when he felt most happy. Hefe looked at the back wall and saw a large scratch carved into the stone wall, the result of a fight that almost cost him his life. He wished he could go back to when he, he and hundreds of thousands of demons worked in buildings identical to this, to break the will of humans that were sent there, to punish them for their act actions and to give them a new purpose and service as Samael. Now the buildings that made up the wards were empty, and as Hefe looked around the bare room, his desire for things in hell returned to how they were only increased. Right, Hef 
with a woman drone. Well, I have some information if you are interested. Go for it, Brie. Hefe ordered. In some sense, Brie was like uh, Hefe's uh, secretary, though she would kill anyone who referred to her as one to her face. Though all manner of demonic entities came to her to deliver messages to Hefe, she prefers the title of information broker. Hefe was the only one to whom Brie gave information for free. She charged everyone else for the topics she provided. First and foremost, your underling, Levi Beckett, has captured your target, Alex Lowe's uh, great-granddaughter, to use as some type of leverage against him. It is rumored that the S-Class agent, Charlotte Matthews, is leading an investigation into the girl's whereabouts. Damn it, Hefe scowled. You will need to have Alec ready before Charlotte finds a girl, unless... Hefe turned to Bree with an idea. Remind me, your breed, skinwalkers, can they transform into people? Bree shook her head. Nope, only uh, animals. If you want something to mimic uh, a person, your best bet's a doppelganger. But going go any further, I did kind of bring up some uh, creatures that were kind of brought up in uh, mythology and like, different cultures. Uh, skinwalkers is a creature in Navajo belief. And it's just my way of like introducing like creatures from different cultures and bringing them into my story. Doppelganger is actually in uh, German in origin. And there's actually some like interesting like plot twists, there's interesting things uh, about those creatures in real life. For example, uh, skinwalkers can only really transform into animals. They are often described or rumored to be like summoned from like actual witches that the uh, or uh, shamans or whatever that the Navajo kind of believe in. Uh, the uh, doppelgangers kind of has like a sort of little folklore in them. Where there's like a belief that if a doppelganger turns into yourself and you see yourself, you're gonna die soon after. That's essentially one of the like the beliefs about the doppelganger itself. But doppelganger is a type of like spiritual entity that uh that some people kind of believe in. That's just kind of my way, just kind of bringing those creatures to different beliefs that are not necessarily biblical in origin and bringing them into my story. God, Hefe Drone, now I have to track down a spectre on Earth. There is one in hell, but they are a bit of a diva. They reside in the war zone. Terrific, what else you got? Bree gave Hefe a concerned look. Forty demonic entities have died in the past week. Hefe scoffed. I have no interest in the clan wars of the war zone. This wasn't done by the actions of a faction in hell. A single agent of Hyde did this. He had been reported to be traveling in hell for two weeks. Abaddon is intercepting him in the Ashlands now. F.A. rushed out the door, his face white, as he left Bree alone, confused. Stop popping up. The Hyde Agency would not just send any agent to hell. No, the only one who they would send was the agent that stood at the top of the Hyde Agency. The strongest agent who reported to only one person. They were known as a soldier of God. If the soldier was in hell, it was because God ordered him to, and it could not be for a good reason. So this is another thing that I'm kind of appropriating into my story. I think I I mentioned this in book one, but at the time when I was drafting this uh, story, the soldier of God wasn't really like a concept introduced in book in my current draft at the time of book one. It was really only created in this story. But basically in this, uh, we created first in here before I kind of adapted it into book one. But there are like, uh, there's like a saying of people, like, uh, like people in the military or something. Or like, I, you can kind of see like, uh, this quote kind of mentioned in, uh, like movies and stuff where people like soldiers or something kind of refer to themselves as a soldier of God. That's kind of like the inspiration behind adapting this. But it's basically, in this story, it's basically meant to be the Hyde agent that is the strongest of all the others. And really are kind of like held in a higher regard and a higher position than any other agent. If the soldier was in hell, it was because God ordered him to, and it could not be for a good reason. F.A. walked through the streets, stone streets of the Warrens, the heels of his cup, uh, scuffed brown shoes uh, clicking on the cement as he tried to breathe in the air that smelled of decay and sulfur. F.A. paused before the paved streets ended and turned into a red flash, flesh-like material. 
He took a step forward and his shoes uh, sunk in slightly, making a squishing sound as a light red liquid ooze rose to the surface. Efe knew that what he was stepping into was not actually blood, but a type of oil that permeates the soil of hell. Uh, Hefe heard a loud screaming coming from his right, and as he craned his head to look, he saw the large circular compounds that serve as a base where the various factions of Redemos or dead humans tried to live in. The scream was likely an unfortunate soul who was murdered by another within the area referred to as the War Zone. Hefe wished he could bring order to the most chaotic location in hell, but he knew no one there would respect him enough to listen to him. It was all because he broke a taboo in hell that earned him a bad reputation, though he hoped things would change. Hefe was reminded of his re-encounter with Samuel and looked to his left to see the large stone brick fortress. A tear began to form in his eye as he was re reminded of walking down the halls greeted by demons of all kinds. Uh, am I still alive? Yes. That should be. I'm gonna go ahead and pull back up Twitch. Uh, where was I? Uh... I lost my space. I completely lost my space. Uh, I'm just going to go back to this. A tear began to form in his eye as he was reminded of walking down the halls, greeted by demons of all kinds, back when he had respect, back before everything changed. He remembered the sight of seeing Samuel perched on his large black throne as he heard the familiar voice saying, How are you? Samuel stared at greeting, he always opened with any demon. Efe's fist formed a tight ball, and he gritted his teeth. Samael should be here, in hell, not rotting in some prison. Efe looked ahead and spotted a, large, small, a cluster of small shapes standing on a black surface. He knew that was where Abaddon was meeting the Soldier of God, in the black sand-like region no, referred to as the Ash, Ashlands. Eventually, the terrain shifted under Efe's feet from a red, gooey, viscous surface to gray, thick ash. In the distance, Hefe could see several figures gathered, and he knew that was where you would find Abaddon and the soldier. Hefe took a few steps forward, but was halted by a claw-like hand that grabbed his ankle from below the surface. Hefe watched as a figure resembling something that was half-man, half-bat, hammered up to the, from the ground to stand before him. The creature was naked. His frame was scrawny and malnourished, as if he hadn't eaten in days. He had wide eyes with large pointed ears. He had jagged fangs that jutted from his mouth, being perpetually open. Stop hopping up. Thank you for following Amelia Zoe. His arms had thin uh, membrane like wings. Uh, hey, Amelia. Uh, attached to them, and his uh, feet resembled that of an eagle's talons. Hefe uh, surmised that he was some species of a beast class of demon, but he was unsure which. Hey, Ella. Uh, yeah, it's Ella. For some reason, I thought your name was L. Who am I? Uh, the demon pleaded, looking for an identity to latch onto, to which Hefe had none. I don't know, Hefe replied as he walked away, leaving the demon to, question his, uh, qu uh, to ask his question repeatedly. Hey, Kelsey. Uh, Hefe seethed with rage as he wished he could come up with a better with a name for the newborn demon. He wished he was creative enough to make a leadership decision like that, but he was not. He simply lacked creativity. So this scene right here, it was actually kind of revised slightly when I first started writing this. But it's basically meant to parallel the scene that I kind of read earlier. Where, uh, where is it? Where uh, kind of Hefe kind of was reliving a memory of uh, Samael giving him uh, his name uh, over here, and it's basically uh, it's basically meant to be like a sort of parallel to those moments. It's something it's like a tact writing tactic that I created, and I actually use it a lot in this uh, drafting the series. But I basically call this uh, tactic dual symbolism. Where you have two scenes that are similar, but work to serve different purposes. So in this moment, 
is kind of meant to parallel like Hefe, uh, Hefe, the different roles of like Hefe's uh, le desire of being a leader and uh, how he Samuel was being leader. Well, Samuel was there to give a name and identity to Hefe when he was born, but Hefe was unable to do the same thing for this random demon. And it's really kind of meant to like uh, draw a little parallel be uh, between someone who is uh, viewed as to be the true leader of hell, which and someone who wants to be a leader, but is struggling with actually uh, the different aspects of being a leader. That's kind of like the uh, main purpose of these two scenes. Kind of meant to be like similar but different scenes that kind of work to serve like a different like uh, literary purpose. And again, like I'm pretty sure that I'm maybe like the only one. I tried to look into this when I was researching this and uh, my uh, dra drafting this for my uh, for my master's degree, but I couldn't actually find an actual name for this. So I think I may be the first one that actually kind of created that is actually doing this as a literary strategy, which is actually kind of cool. As Efe walked away, his hands balled up into tight fists as he was once again reminded of the leadership qualities he lacked. He remembered the memory he relived just moments ago of his first encounter with Samael, who was there when Hefe was born to give him a name. Hefe hated that he could not give the de a poor demon his name as he knew the bat-like creature would be doomed to wander hell until a name was given. A part of Hefe wanted to return to give him a name, but nothing came up that he could offer. The name a demon was given can't be any name. A common name like Bob would never be accepted by a newly born demon. A demon's name must represent something, often power or strength. For Hefe, his given name Dylan had a weight attached to it, which signified Hefe as a first of a new breed of demons. So this information about like uh, this plot twist about like names being important to demons is kind of really kind of inspired off of the... Uh, Superstitious belief that if you know the name of a demon, you can have control over it. It's something that I actually kind of heard a lot, uh, like a while ago, like when I was younger. But it's something that I don't really hear too much talk, hear talked about too much now. But that's kind of like the inspiration behind why the date names are being so important. Like names are more than just a title; it's a symbol for a demon. It's it's not like what they are, it's who they are. Uh, when will it be released? Uh, this this part is part of book two that's probably gonna be like a couple years out. Book one is almost finished and uh, hopefully it'll be released uh, within a couple months. One of the main reasons Hefe lacked respect among the dissidents of hell was that Hefe was not his given name. Hefe was a name he stole from his mentor. He died a thousand years ago when uh, Samuel's attempt to create the apocalypse resulted in him and his followers being either captured or held. I keep on having like, the Omen Gaming Hub pop up telling me to restart the app and I don't want to do that. Uh, even after a thousand years of living under the name Hefe, he gained only a handful of followers. He was reminded that he lacked many qualities befitting a leader with every passing day. Every resident of hell knew this fact, and for that, they were not willing to follow someone they viewed as a thief, someone that they considered unworthy. It was common for de some demons to go by a different name later in life. An example is a name that represented an animal like a snake. However, the term still must be given by another demon, and it cannot be changed by the user of the name itself. Those that change their name on their own lose the respect of their peers, and they often must work harder to regain their lost respect. The process of receiving a name is a ritual that residents of hell hold in a high regard. Even Redemos, dead humans, participate in it from time to time. It is a ritual backed with honor, and those who went against a pre-established ritual were deemed honorless. That was how the residents of hell viewed Hefe, one lacking honor. Hefe approached a group of uh, gathered demons and stood to the left of a demon who Hefe was all too familiar with. He was one of the first and most powerful demons born in hell. His species was referred to as Titan, and he was the last survivor of his kind. He was someone who still remained, uh, maintained his devout loyalty to Samael and remained to be one of the few that was hopeful for Samael's safe return, even if most had given up. His presence inspired fear, even among the strong, and he was not someone to be messed with. He was a demon, Abaddon. 
Before we go uh, further, Abaddon is actually the name of, I think, one of the Knights of Hell in uh, the reference of the Bible. Rather the Bible or like some other, some more religious text. He is kind of like described as a really powerful demonic entity. And that's essentially what uh, what he's kind of, what I'm trying to depict him here. He's, he's like a demon that kind of has like a lot of influence in this world, but it's also kind of like the last of his uh, species. And I actually am planning on kind of using him as an uh, the main antagonist for a game that I'm hoping to develop if I get accepted in a uh, position of a writer in a video game company. Abaddon, in some regard, can be the textbook depiction of a demon seen in medieval religious literature. His whole body was colored a, dark, a shade of dark blue. He had backwards knees and hooved feet. His arms, though muscular, only had three fingers on his hands. His head was rigid, ridged, as if there was a spike of bone dividing the top of his skull. His eyes were dark red, but below it was a broad nose with fang-like teeth pe peeking over his lips. The archaic stereotypes of old uh, depicting demons had some type of reflection on Abaddon and his species. Still, the depiction of Samael or the devil could not be further from the truth. F.A. turned his attention to the lone soldier of God. He looked like he was a figure out of his place in time. He wore a white cape covering a chainmail shirt and brown cloth pants. Around his neck hung a necklace with a black medallion with a red Templar cross emblazoned on it. He held the hilt of his sword on his hands, but his blade was one of light. F.A. was surprised to see the soldier of God was a, sword, was a swordman, assuming those died out hundreds of the years ago. It is not every day people of hell are greeted with the soldier of God, Heffer remarked. What did that coward send you for? The soldier eased up slightly. Hey, Lena. You the leader of hell? A couple of demons in the crowd began to laugh, much of his annoyance. Hell hasn't had a leader since you dogs lo uh, locked him up in your prison. Uh, the soldier's eyes narrowed. I was sent here by God to bring him Lilith. Where can I find her? Abaddon growled in anger. You bastards took so much from us, and now you want her? Your luck ran out. The only person who can summon Lilith uh, to them is her, is her creator, Samael, have explained, a smile forming on his lips, on his face. Tell you what, you release Samael from his prison, and he will bring you Lilith. The soldier sighed. Yeah, that is not going to happen, you putain de fils. Uh... He that's a uh, Spanish, uh, uh, sorry, that's uh, French for son of a bitch. Uh, he readied his uh, sword once more, anticipating a fight. Listen here, Frenchman, swear all you uh, like, but if you aren't willing to make a trade, F.A. pauses Mark as if, he, if, as if he was proud of his joke, then there is nothing for you here. But don't worry, I'm sure Abaddon would be more than willing to put down an old dog like you. Let me make something clear. The uh, soldier's blade grew, uh, white grew as he, uh, larger as it spoke. I am tired of being compared to a dog. My name is Jean-Michel Devereux. I am a French Templar who fought in the Crusades, and I will not go down easily. This is actually something that I... Uh, before I kind of go forward, initially in my uh, writing of this, I have not... This is actually you know, the first time you would see Jean Michel Devereux. He's going to be the main protagonist of what will be the third trilogy. And every protagonist is going to have like this sort of like catchphrase to try and make them more memorable to the reader. And I was really struggling with uh, kind of coming up with a uh, catchphrase for uh, Jean. I didn't actually kind of create one until after uh, I, I kind of had his character developed uh, by an artist that I hired. Uh, but uh, this was actually going to be like his original uh, catchphrase, but now his catchphrase is going to be, uh, God help us. So I like it meant to be like a sarcastic tone, but anyway. Epic began to turn uh, uh, and walk away as John held his Templar pendant and spoke a prayer. May God forgive the action I'm about to take, and may he have mercy on these wayward souls. Epic turned toward uh, Abaddon and said, bring me that zealot's head. Abaddon growled his response. I am not your pawn, Dylan. F.A. scowled and walked away as the two uh, voices began to clash. He hated that he was a pariah within hell. 
that even the most powerful demon or the weakest refused to give him the respect he desired. Even so, this encounter reinforced Hefe's desire to release Samael from his prison and restore order to hell. Alec Lowe was integral to making that happen, even if he didn't realize it. The people of hell had suffered enough. It was time for a change. Hefe was willing to do anything to make it happen. So this is kind of like the first instance of, well, it's kind of the only instance of this writing sample, but within this well, this is kind of the extra to book two, but within book two, this will be the first instance of you kind of seeing like Hefe struggle. As I mentioned before, he's kind of like a character that is desires to be a leader worthy of res respect and have like a decent following, but he doesn't really have the respect or the acknowledgement from his peers in order to become a leader like that. But uh, this is kind of the first and really only thing, of the only uh, sense of this uh, extract of this project, where you kind of see his like, desires for being a leader. But unfortunately, uh, you won't be able to kind of see a conclusion of him, of his character arc, until this this thing is kind of finished and written as a book. Uh, when I am finished with book one, so unfortunately, this is kind of the only time you'll get to kind of see his character thing. Uh, Michael. Michael had arrived at a crossroads. He believed working for the Primal Order was a uh, lost cause for the long, longest time. Again, like the Primal Order is uh, it's kind of the first time kind of, they're mentioned in this uh, stream. But Primal Order is the main antagonist of this uh, series. One of the main antagonists of this uh, book, I should say. Now Michael is beginning to wonder if it was too late to turn back. He was in the hidden city of Kalona a te technological marvel that was settled high in heaven's mountains. The town was a base of operation for his people to, to conduct their research into the mysteries of life. Since humanity was accepted into heaven, however, everything changed. The only eighth year, his people, that still resided in Kelowna was Uriel. Uriel was someone who studied the creation of synthetic life and was Michael's closest friend. Michael walked along the uh, steel streets of Kelowna, illuminated, illuminated by neon lights above and bordered by ru running water underneath a, a layer of clear glass. He passed many people in long robes, each with identical faces, the clone creation of Uriel, who worked to keep the uh, city of Kelowna afloat. Kelowna, uh, though located in a mountain range, was not built on the mountains but around them. Kelowna utilized high-tech zero gravity to keep it hovering at the peaks of heaven. The city was quiet, apart from the steady hum of various machines and the sparse murmurs of the clone workers. As Michael walked the streets, he took notice of the unique buildings that peeked over the skyline, buildings that were once home to the six scientists that worked to investigate the different aspects of life. Almost all were abandoned, and Michael sighed as he remembered the glory days of Kelowna. Stop popping up. Uh, a part of him wished uh, for things to return to the way they were, though he knew that would never happen. Michael's eyes went to the only building still active, still used by someone intelligent and not a clone worker, Uriel's lab. Michael approached the glass doors, and in his reflection stood something that he didn't, he almost didn't recognize himself. His dark skin was glossy with sweat, his brown eyes had a defeated look, and his once elegant black wings now sagged behind him. Michael grimaced as he opened the door. He hated that it looked so pitiful. Inside was an empty room with a series of colored panels on the op opposing sides of a singular door. It was a system he and Uriel developed long ago. The door led to a hallway containing a series of rooms that held one of Uriel's research projects. One of the color panels would light up to indicate what room Uriel was in. Michael scaled the room and noticed a yellow, light, a yellow one was a light, the Ages Room. Michael passed through the door and walked up through the hallway towards the entrance, marked by a yellow stripe. He hated the Ages Room because he always managed to break something with annoyed Uriel. Michael passed uh, through the door and paused when he noticed the room was larger and it had lar holographic signs to indicate the different aspects of human humanity. Prehistoric. Iron Age, Middle Age, and Modern. Each age took place in a grassy plain in a 30 by 30 foot space uh, border, uh, bordered by a holographic black and yellow no crossing sign. The ages were surrounded by walkways and in the center was a beautiful woman with brown hair and brown wings. 
as she was holding a glass tablet scrolling through lines of text. Michael's eyes lit up. Uriel, he rushed forward, forgetting the no-crossing sign and stepped onto into the square and labeled as Iron Age. Stop, Michael. Uriel's bright blue eyes grew wide with shock. Michael froze, one foot in the field as he smashed sto a small stone home under his foot. He looked down and saw a small one-inch-tall figure resembling a human raising his face in, face in anger, shouting something barely uh, intelligible. Michael retracted his foot and chose to follow the path to Uriel as she held her head in her hand and shook it in disappointment. Sorry, Uriel. Uriel. You know, I was thinking with the border of a sign saying no crossing, you wouldn't be quick to smash up my models. Uriel uttered as she gave Michael a solemn look. What do you want? Michael approached Uriel. Hey, Amelia, cool? Uh, Michael approached Uriel. His eyes were apologetic as he prepared what he was going to say. I'm beginning to think you are right. I'm right about a lot of things. Uh, what am I right about this time? Your opinion of God? Uh, your uh, poor posture? Your anger problems? Uriel parted play playfully. He loved toying with Michael. Michael was always a type of uh, bullhead brute that made mistakes, thinking he was right only to need uh, to apologize when he realized it was wrong. Uriel loved, most of all, the satisfaction of the I told you so she often gave Michael. So this is actually something that uh, is kind of like Uriel's character trait. There are uh, kind of like 12 figures from the Bible that are uh, kind of have roles in my story. But as of right now, only about five or six are uh, present. And uh, Uriel is one of six people that are meant to represent the scientists that were charged in creating life. Uriel was someone who specialized in creating synthetic life. And she and the other scientists are uh, kind of meant to represent like a different form of intelligence. God, for example, is kind of meant to be subtle intelligence. Like, when you're speaking with him, you wouldn't really, un you wouldn't really get the feeling that he was that smart because he likes to play dumb. He likes to... Uh, he doesn't really like to wear his intelligence on his sleeve. Uriel, on the other hand, is someone who is sort of like in your face. Like she likes, she likes people to. She likes essentially being right, and she kind of, uh, and she kind of like, where she's very proud of her intelligence. And whenever she, uh, whenever someone realizes that they were wrong, she was always quick to like kind of point it out. That's kind of like who her character was kind of based off. She's essentially kind of like those annoying people that kind of are quick to like correct people on their mistakes like their grammar or whenever they say something that's factually incorrect that's an issue Uriel is based on hey I don't have anger problems I just get irritated at times Michael said trying to defend himself to which Uriel rolled her eyes I'm beginning to think you were right about the primal order well I don't want to say I told you so but Uriel uttered as she waited for Michael's response, but he gave her a blank, emotionless expression. What made you change your mind? I joined because I wondered if Samuel was right about his prediction of the Hyde Agency and light being too powerful. I joined because although I disagreed with the apocalypse that Samuel wanted to create, the idea of controlling the apocalypse seemed to be the better method. Michael paused to draw his breath. Recently, though, I have been wondering if it is even worth it to control the apocalypse. The thing Simon wants from us, it is getting to be too much. Uh, just as a quick reminder for those just tuning in, Simon is the leader of the Primal Order. And he was uh, once uh, Michael's close friend. Uriel paused to pace towards uh, the section labeled Modern. In the center stood a miniature city with vehicles roaming the streets surrounded by a dense micro forest. Uriel withdrew a pair of scissors and snipped a branch off a small tree growing over the walkway before she spoke. I have always wondered if Samuel wanted the apocalypse to be an all-out war between demons or angel and angels, or if he wanted something else. He had always been a cunning individual, and something as boorish as war never made sense. It's possible that what Samuel wants to create is not what Samuel wanted. Michael paused as he looked uh, down at his hands of guilt. Gabriel is dead because of the Prime Order. Even if I voted against it, his blood is on my hands. I have to make things right. Gabriel uh, is one of the Aether, 
Uh, he's actually uh, what was an archangel in the Bible, and he actually died early on in uh, book one. Uh, Uriel approached uh, Michael and hugged him. At the end of the day, you always do what you think is right. I'm glad you are thinking clearly, Lyle. Uriel pulled herself away from Michael, her hands on his shoulders. But the Primal Order the Network of Spies means they likely know of your betrayal. You should go home and prepare. If you need anything, I am here for you. A tear began to run down Michael's face as he turned to walk away, but his foot mistakenly stepped out the path pathway and crushed a couple of trees. Sorry, Uriel. Uriel covers her eyes with her hand and shakes her head once again. Just go, Michael. Every time. A couple of hours later, Michael was at his home, crouching over a large black case on his bright red sofa. Uh, his house was uh, made of a mixture of stone and wood. Uh, the walls being stone brick uh, bordered by wooden beams. He had an open uh, back book bookcase with, mem with memorabilia of both human and atheist designs. The trinkets ranged from snow globes to a holographic display of an unknown planet rotating on its axis. Behind him stood a uh, large brick fireplace, flame ablaze with a bright orange flame. Above it stood a stuffed head with a moose, and on the walls uh, surrounding it were paintings of environments of both heaven and earth. Michael uh, opened the bl uh, black case and st uh, saw a large steel sword with a red gem in its hilt. The blade, had, the blade was jagged and sharp enough to slice the finger off if he wasn't careful. The door to his home opened and slammed quickly shut. Michael closed his eyes and muttered, I'm surprised it took you this long to find me, Simon. Excuse me. So you knew one would come, and you would still betray us? A voice echoed from the next room as a figure sauntered into the room. Simon wore a long white robe and had short, curly ha red hair. His eyes, though bright blue, were emotionless as he stared at Michael with a blank look on his face. Simon did not care why Michael wanted to leave him. To Simon, anyone who quit his organization with, was a traitor and was punished by death. Michael's eyes drew towards the uh, golden rings around uh, Simon's rest, wrist. His choice of weapon from when he was a soldier of God. Even though he quit a couple weeks into the position, what he experienced drove him toward his goal of controlling the apocalypse. I can no longer stand by what we do, Simon. I want out before we go too far, Michael demanded, his expression stern as it glared at Simon. The only way you leave our organization is if you are dead. The dead tell no tales. If I let you live, what will you do? Leave us be or rat us out? Michael began to uh, slowly restore the hilt of his sword. I can't sit by and let your organization go any further. I'm going to tell God what I know. Are you an idiot? On his face grew red with anger. The, and the bracelets on his wrist began to glow yellow. Even if you tell God who leads the prime order and get them arrested, they will be out within a week. You can silence the others, but you can't silence me. No one in our organization knows where I reside. With my connections, anyone in, uh, locked inside the Hyde Agency Citadels will be eventually released. Now that I know what you are planning, I can't let you live. Simon took his hand and pointed it towards Michael's head. The braces began to glow brighter and brighter. Michael quickly grabbed his uh, sword and slashed the, the light beam in two, hitting black marks on the wall behind him. The beam could easily take out Michael's heads ahead. Uh, uh, Mar uh, Simon's mark marksmanship with those braces could put the best snipers in any military to shame. The blade was ignited with red flames as Michael held the sword steadily in front of him. Are you sure you want to go this route, Simon? Simon's eyes narrowed as he seemed to glare at the sword. The flaming sword of Michael. I thought it was a myth. Simon's hands began to shake as he rested them at his side. It said that you used the sword to combat Samael in the Book of Revelation. Michael's voice was stern as he spoke. Not everything in the Bible should be accepted as fact. The Book of Revelation has some truth, uh, some truth to it. The horsemen reference do exist, but I have never fought Samael, nor do I want to. It is still considered to be the most powerful weapon of light in existence. Samael lowered his arms, a smug smile forming on his face. I would be a fool to fight against that weapon, but I don't need to be the one to kill you. I have millions of spies spread throughout the heaven. One of them will be more than willing to plant a knife in your back. Michael's eyes grew narrow. I welcome them to, I welcome them to try. Go! 
Michael swung his horse toward Simon, who avoided it and ran out of the house. The fire extinguished from the blade, and Michael, uh, as Michael uh, pushed aside the black case and sat down at the couch, resting the sword on the couch's arm. Michael swore under his breath, enough times to make a demon proud. He realized Simon was right. Or was right. The only way the Primal Order would be defeated is if Simon were to be taken down. He was a glue that kept the organization together, and he was the most elusive of the members. No one knew where Samuel lived, and Simon was only found when he wanted to be seen. Simon was, by all accounts, a ghost, and so long as it was left unchecked, the Primal Order would never be defeated. So this is the second to last section that we're going to be reading today, and kind of the second action sequence of Out of Blow, but it's also going to be the most... It's going to be kind of an interesting section uh, it's, uh, because it just kind of was like the turning point to the story, at least for Alec Lowe. Uh, before I go any further, I did want to try to address something that kind of changed uh, with this uh, uh, with this uh, version. Uh, in the, uh, since I started, since I first started writing this for my master's uh, degree, uh, this scene actually had was revised like several times and uh initially how i had written simon in the scene and how i had written uh 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 uriel was kind of written in a way where a lot of people reading this a lot of people that were critiquing it for my uh, uh creative writing class they actually didn't really like uh their characters as much and when the initial draft, uh, Simon, uh, he left in a different way. And he, uh, it was kind of like almost as if he was like being a coward when he left. Like as if he was afraid of Michael even after attacking him. And in, initially, like, uh, in the first draft, I didn't even like have the threat of him like having his spies be the one to kill him. And I also didn't really have the stakes of uh, Simon. Uh, it would be important that Simon had to be the one that uh, got taken down for the Primal Order to be defeated as a whole. And uh, so before that, like there was no stakes to this. I, Simon just simply left and Michael was just kind of like ruminating. And I didn't have the threat, so it just kind of made Simon just appear to be a coward. So that's one of the things I had to change in revisions. And I think it kind of cha it kind of changed in a more positive way, and this uh this section actually kind of has like a reference to a video game that I like uh, that I was always kind of fascinated with as a story, and I'll kind of get into that when we uh, get there. Alec Lowe. Alec was standing in front of Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas, waiting for Levi to show up. It was midday, and the streets were abuzz with activity. Cars were driving along the roads, some limousines and performance vehicles. He had never been to Las Vegas before, and a part of him wished he was here for pleasure, though he never was much of a gambler. He noticed many uh, buildings had neon signs turned off, and in front of Caesar's Palace was an ornate fo fountain running in a well-decorated square. Alec pulled out a his pipe, filled it with tobacco, and began to smoke it. A part of him wished the hide agents had the luxury of visiting cities and landmarks on Earth, instead of only when their missions led them here. He would love to return to New York and see how much it had changed since he worked there as a detective when he was alive. Again, like, this is something that kind of changed uh, since I started developing uh, book one, since I kind of finished revision, uh, writing uh, book one. He was not a detective in New York, he was a detective in Los Angeles. Uh, so that's something that kind of changed. Uh, Alec was uh, stunned out of his reminiscence when he felt a hard slap on his back, causing him to choke on the smoke. He heard a familiar gruff voice utter, Careful, Proby. Smokey will kill you. Alec turned and glared at Levi Beckett, who shined his yellow uh, teeth in a cocky grin. I don't have to worry about lung cancer since I am dead. Why are you so happy? Why? Have X in his arms. This is a city of sin. We can get a room, get wasted, gamble. Oh, I can hire a couple of hookers. We are not here for fun. All we are doing is finding out where the leaders of this cult are meeting, planting a bug in the room, and leaving. Vega's face turned sour as he glared at uh, Alec in annoyance. Goddamn Boy Scout. 
A group of girls approached Alec and Becca with the camera. Can you take our picture? Uh, Becca turned and gave the girls a menacing glare, causing them to back up. Alec decided to intervene. I would love to. The girls begrudgingly handed uh, the camera to Alec as, he st uh, as they stood in front of the fountain. Alec aimed at the camera at them and stayed with a smile. On the count of three, you say Fuzzy Pickles. The girls began to laugh and Alec continued. One, two, three, Fuzzy Pickles. This scene right here is actually a reference to the game Earthbound. It was a thing that's uh, called either Mother 1 or Mother 2 in Japan. Uh, there is like a moment, uh, several moments in the game where uh, like when you get to certain locations, a cameraman will literally just come out, for, drop down from the air and it has like a really iconic line in that game where he says, Pictures taken instantaneously. I'm a photographic genius if I do say so myself. On the count of three, say Fuzzy Pickles. One, two, three, Fuzzy Pickles. And it learned, the picture is taken with the main uh, protagonist, Ness, holding a peace sign and smiling. And uh, that's kind of what this uh, series is kind of referencing. Uh, this uh, moment is kind of referencing. I love Earthbound as a game. That's like such a fascinating storyline uh even if like it's just an old like 8-bit uh, thing it still has like an incredible story uh as one that's kind of my paying tribute to that uh game alec handed the camera to the group tapped back in on his shoulder and gestured for him to follow as two walked in alec was stunned to see the ca casino's interior everything was ornate and it looked like they had walked into some billionaire's mansion the carpet was bright wet, red, the walls are white and lined with gold paint and some fancy design some uh, and some paintings decorated the walls. As soon as the two walked in, Alec could hear slot machines activating. Two words welcomed them in uh, near the uh, entryway and gestured toward the receptionist at the end of the walkway. Excuse me. Alec felt as if he was in some movie. He had never been to Las Vegas and, or experienced this type of thing. As the only casinos Alec went to was related to a case he was working on when he was alive, and they were the illegal sort. Levi groaned as he looked around the room. Too rich for my blood. Alec laughed as they walked uh, toward the receptionist, who greeted them with a smile. As they, as they approached, they heard the high and welcome to Caesar's Palace line that the receptionist had probably stated in the same manner about a hundred times today. Hey, Ira. Alec was not paying attention to the receptionist as his eyes were drawn towards the silver chain bracelet with an ash pain uh, that hung loosely from her wrist. The place had the Latin words Needmer and Vetidum, translated as Restrive for the Forbidden. This is actually something I'm actually planning on changing when I develop this into book two. Uh, there is a uh, line that is kind of like integral to like the Hyatt Agency that was actually once like their motto, their company motto, I guess you could say, which is uh, strive to be extraordinary. It's a line that's kind of meant to uh, to re reflect like the importance of self improvement within the high agency, and it's uh, kind of meant to be like a words of inspiration for a high agent to improve themselves and to grow stronger. And uh, this is actually something I do kind of want to change. Where I want uh, it to be, uh, I want it to be, uh, try to be extraordinary, this uh, line here. And I want to find the Latin phrase for that, a translation for that. And I think it would be kind of cool if I developed this, where I kind of hint that the person who gave her that necklace, uh, that uh, bracelet, was actually like uh, formally connected to the Hyde Agency. And that's something that I thought would be kind of cool. I uh, just got a little, neat little nod there. But uh, this is actually something that I uh, that kind of like created like in the heat of the moment uh, for when I was developing this for my uh, for my master's project. But I want to change this to kind of reflect like the uh, the line that's kind of important for the hot age that, that I created after. I uh, developed and published uh, uh, since this ended up be published. Alec had to learn Latin when he was in school. Most schools taught Latin when he was growing up. Uh, how can I help you? The receptionist question, pulling uh, Alec from his trance. Sorry, I was admiring your bracelet. We strive for the forbidden. 
Nice phrase. Alex smiled as he uh, met her eyes. Thanks. My grandma gave it to me. So this is kind of one of those things I, I thought would be kind of uh, would kind of work. Uh, where uh, because her grandma gave it to her, like it's possible that she could have been connected to the hide agency. As a quick reminder, uh, there hasn't really been kind of uh, brought up in this uh, in this extract too much, but there is a group of people uh, known as guides that are basically humans that are partnered with hide agents who are essentially deceased humans. Uh, that essentially kind of help them acclimate to like the change in times because there could be like someone who is from like the middle ages who is going into like the environment of the modern day who would not be uh, as familiar with the uh, with like the aspect of cars or planes and stuff and the guides are kind of meant to kind of be like their link to the present uh, time However, I also, that's also something that did kind of change as I developed my story, where, uh, because Hyde Asians have, like, this sort of, like, supernatural power with how they're able to, like, manipulate the, uh, a power system known as light to, uh, be able to, uh, uh, kind of use it to combat demons. I'm thinking about and um, one thing I'm changing in revisions of book one is kind of making it so that people exposed to that power, hide agents, are often kind of, I guess, like changed, where it's easy for them to just kind of forget like who they are and just think they can just rely on their abilities to do anything, everything, which kind of like changes their personality a bit, and one of the reasons why I uh one of the things I'm changing in the in book one is making guides uh, also kind of serve to remind a hide agent that they are human that they're not like some overpowered like entity who won't do anything like Superman that they're still human they still have like a role to play and uh, that's something that I'm kind of hinting at in revising book one something I want to make referenced here is because Alec is not partnered with a guide in this story. He's partnered with a demon, essentially. Uh, he will not have access to that sort of, like, crutch that sort of reminds him of who he is. And when I developed this into book uh, two, uh, when I'm writing book two, when uh, book one is finished, uh, he is going to have a moment where, because he lacks that uh, human connection, he kind of, I guess, like falls apart uh, more easily. Uh, by the end of this, uh, what this is gonna be like part one of book two, and it's gonna have a moment where he kind of loses control of himself, and uh, that's kind of one of the things I, I'm kind of changing within this, uh, uh, changing within book one that's gonna be important for revising this for book two. The receptionist had long brown hair uh, tied in a ponytail, brown eyes, and red lipstick. Her fingernails were neatly uh, manicured and painted red, and her name tag had a neatly printed jazz attached. Jazz had an honest, kind-hearted appearance uh, to her, and it was rare for, for Alec to meet someone with a remnant of an ancient language attached to them. Alec was expecting her to give a quizzical response when he gave the translation of the text. He wondered how much Latin she knew, or if it was just one phrase. We were told a group of uh, religious leaders will be meeting here in one of your conference rooms. Alex started, uh, Alex started trying to phrase his question carefully. He wanted to know what room they were in. Janet's smile faded as she looked at Alex and Le uh, Levi. Your police? I'm sorry, but we were obligated to uh, protect the identities of our biz business clients. Unless you have a warrant, I can't give you any information. Alec was shoved aside by Beckett, whose face was beginning to be enveloped by thin black strands of darkness as he growled. You know where these people will be meeting. Tell me what I want to know. Uh, Jazz's eyes grew wide and her face went pale. I, I, Beckett interrupted her. Tell me! Jazz made an audible yelp as she blurted out. They'll be meeting in uh, 32A in a couple hours. Don't kill me. So this is, uh... I, this is something you kind of saw in action if you uh, saw my last stream, but as a quick reminder, Beckett is capable of using like a, a ability of darkness that all demons have. 
uh, known as influence is essentially like their way of compelling others to obey by kind of focusing darkness and the power of darkness into their eyes to kind of influence the behavior and actions of other people, oftentimes humans. And it's kind of different for different people. Like, for example, like in book one, when I had my character Zara, who was a succubus, use the power of influence, she, her, when she used it, others actually wanted uh, voluntarily to do what she wanted. It wasn't like based on fear, it was based on like a desire to please her. Whereas when Hefe, uh, when uh, Beckett uses it in the scene, he kind of terrifies and traumatizes others into thinking that they will die if they don't uh, give him what he wants. Uh, Alex slapped Beckett on the back of the head. Take a walk. He approached Jazz cautiously. Internally, he was mad at Beckett for doing this. Hey, are you okay? Jazz beginning to hyperventilate. Oh my god, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You aren't going to die, I promise. Take deep breaths and calm down. You aren't cops. Who are you? I turned towards Beckett as he was using his reflection in the glass of a painting to pick something out of his teeth. He noticed some of the guests were watching Beckett from a distance. One of the stewards at the entrance was using a radio to talk to someone, likely calling security. Alec realized he uh, needed to wrap things up before they caused too much of a scene. He drew a deep breath and said the first thing that came to mind. We are mentalists. Alec gave, uh, uh, J Jazz gave Alec a look of confusion as he turned around, grabbed Beckett by his arm tight, and led him down the hall. Beckett resisted, but Alec was firm. His job as a hide agent was to protect humanity from the threat of demons. Now he could only watch as Beckett potentially traumatized an innocent girl. Alec knew this partnership had to end. Beckett was now making Alec's job more difficult. However, as he looked at Beckett, he couldn't help but feel that he was to blame for Beckett's anger and aggression. Even if it was misplaced, he knew that Beckett uh, blamed Alec for his incarceration and subsequent death. He was reminded of Spade's words once again a couple of months ago. Once again, like Spade is uh, the main antagonist of book one, and uh, he had a moment at the end of the series, uh, at the end of book one, I should say, uh, where he uh, essentially made Alec realize that things with uh, the Hyde Agency is not all, like people within the Hyde Agency are not all uh, good, and that the Hyde Agency had problems in how they were ran. And at the end of book one, like, Alec will essentially promise Spade that he will be the one to kind of cause change within the Hyde Agency. Uh, Spade, uh, he was reminded of Spade's word, words once again from a couple months ago, and he began to wonder if there was anything he could do to fix things between him and Beckett. Alec approached the room uh, where the meeting was being held and saw a red light on the electronic lock. He pulled out his uh, bronze pocket watch with glowing green glyphs encircling it and pressed the button activating his cloak. The device made him unable to be seen or heard by the human element and permitted him to pass through walls. The two passed through the door as if it were nothing, and Alec began to look uh, for something to place his listening device on. He looked at the large table with several chairs surrounding it, a painting on the wall, and finally a potted plant that he deemed to be the perfect place. He silently walked to the plant, put a small device near the edge of the pot, and stood up to glare at Beckett, who was giving him a smug look. I'm guessing the little boy scout is mad at me, Beckett pondered in a condescending tone. What, the poor little agent is upset by how I scared that stupid girl? What you did was wrong, Alec had reached his breaking point. I was fine working with you so long as I could still do my job as a hide agent. What you did put that girl at risk and almost exposed me. The Hyde Agency's goal is to protect humanity from the threat of demons while working in the shadows. I had to lie to that girl to cover for you. And I know I left her even more confused. We're done, Beckett. We can't work together anymore. Alec held up his hand to open a portal of light and passed through as Beckett stood near the door. A couple hours passed and uh, Alec was in the Hyde Agency's mobile headquarters, known as a cottage, his secret base of operations. He was in a room with several large monitors displaying a uh, security cam cam camera footage owned by the casino. Only one monitor picked up the bugs uh, wavelengths, pointing sounds from the conference room with people just coming in. To Alex left was a supervisor and someone who ran the cottage, Hugo Winters. 
Eagle was wearing a denim jacket and jeans as he was uh, leaning over the monitor holding a pair of headphones up to one ear. He held up a hand and made a chatting uh, gesture to signify people were talking. Ala quickly put up a, a put on a second pair of headphones and the two listened silently. Damn the hide agent messing with our affairs. How do you even find out about us? But Demon spoke. Oh, fine, no. We consider that location in Rockley to be a bust now that they, that agent had discovered it. Second Demon responded. The third Demon uh, groaned out loud before speaking up. Father Nicky has gone to hiding in his bunker until the heat dies down. The first demon replied, We consider St. Mary's to be closed now. The door swung open, and a voice uh, familiar to Alec uh, exclaimed in a frantic voice, Sirs, I'm sorry, I ex accidentally exposed your connection to location to. Oh, God, what are you doing here? A voice Alec knew to be Becker responded, Hello, boys. The one to uh, squeal at the loudest gets to tell me uh, what you know. Don't expect anyone to survive till the end of the night, though. A cacophony of screams echoed in the mic as Alec uh, threw down his headset and met Hugo's eyes in terror and horror. I need to go now. Hugo got up and rushed out of the room demanding, Wait, I am going to. Let me get my flask. You're choosing now to drink? Hugo uh, turned around the hallway. My flask is my cloak. Let me grab it from my office and we can go. It was too late when, have, when Alec and Hugo arrived in the room. The bodies were mutilated and Becca was gone. Hugo and Alec were standing near the doorway to the room. Their presence was hidden from the effects of the cloak. Hugo was speaking, but Alec wasn't listening. He was stuck in a trance. It almost seemed like a dream to him, as if he would wake up at any moment and this wouldn't have happened. No matter how long he waited, he couldn't wake up. This was reality. Alec felt a nudge on his arm and his trance ended. He looked at Hugo, who had an apologetic look on his face. Hugo took a moment before he spoke in a relaxed tone. Alec, I hope you realize that Hugo, uh, Hyde agents cannot work alongside he, the demons. Alec's voice quivered. Beckett isn't a demon. He's human. He's a redeemos. Alec, Hugo gestured towards the bodies as first responders are beginning to arrive on the scene. Uniformed police officers who were way out of their element. Only a demon could do something like this. Levi uh, Beckett has been dead for almost a hundred years. Whatever morals he had are now, are now gone. This is what makes him more demon than redeemer. I looked at the body as a police officer crouched down with the gloved hand. He lifted lifted the severed arm with a bloody silver bracelet. Uh, Alex's eyes began to flow with tears. He cried for the first time in ages as he realized he had broken his promise to that girl. He promised her that she wasn't uh, going to die. He should have said, we're in for the hills. You weren't going to survive this day. He uh, turned around and slammed his fist on the wall, which didn't even give off a faint thud. He screamed his frustration into the open air, almost forgetting to keep the button on his pocket watch pressed, which would have undone his cloak. These deaths could have been prevented. If Alec had not been working with Levi Beckett, these people would still be alive, and Alec had to live with that mistake. And this is the last section of this, uh, uh, of this uh, project, and after we read this, I'm actually going to show off uh, the prologue of what will be book one that is actually kind of I'm wrapping up the uh, revision process, the second round of revisions for book one, and I'll be sitting in to get uh, professionally edited, and hopefully it'll be published, sending it in to be published uh, soon after. But uh, we're going to read this last section, which will kind of co conclude this project. And uh, then we'll kind of, uh, I'll kind of show, uh, take a brief moment, just kind of explain like, the process beyond writing this and kind of my experience uh, towards writing this project as a whole. And uh, then we will kind of wrap things up by reading the, uh, me reading the prologue and just kind of discussing my uh, story. God was split between two aspects of his life, one being the past he walked away from, the identity he abandoned, and the mistakes he made, the other being his present and future. Using an identity he adopted to hide from his past mistakes, his identity of God was meant to be flawless, the type of person that never made mistakes, the ideal leader. The identity he abandoned, his given name Jehovah, was life filled with memories that still haunted him. His meeting with the mysterious figure of Ezekiel Graham, uh, just as a reminder, Ezekiel Graham uh, was uh, a character introduced earlier on in this uh, extract. 
he kind of had like some knowledge of who God was before he adopted the mantle of God. And uh, he kind of uh, was kind of meant to be a more mysterious figure that God just could not like figure out like who he was. And he, he just appeared like out of thin air by uh, using like a device that he took from another uh, person that God actually recognized. Like, he recognized where the device was from, but uh, that's actually who Ezekiel Graham was. Uh, his meeting with the mysterious figure of Ezekiel Graham forced him to relive those memories and forced him to remember the mistake he made that created a rift between him and the friends he held dear. Now, as God approached a large, elevated manor somewhere in the clearing west of the heavenly, heavenly city of Vestasia, he knew we would have to confront this identity. A part of him enjoyed the image humanity painted of him, an all-powerful, all-knowing all deity, a man with a plan. To him, the identity of God was perfect in every way. Still, as Ezekiel pointed out, it was all a facade. Ultimately, God was running away from the past and haunted him. Within the manor laid his ally, uh, Pravul, a genius in his own right to specialize in creating dimensions. He made the hell realm of heaven reside in, hell, uh, purgatory, and thousands of apocalyptic dimensions that house various facilities owned by the higher agency. At one point, he was banished from betraying God to support Samael, the devil. The recent events have shown the, uh, God that he was wrong and removed his sentencing. Now he might have the answers he desired. As God ascended the stairs, he had reached a small platform where a bright portal opened out of the corner of his eyes, a form of transportation utilized by hide agents. God turned, and his loyal soldier, uh, Jean-Michel Devereux, passed through holding the side. God knew he should be uh, resting since his encounter with Abaddon in hell. Jean barely survived and had to flee before Abaddon could kill him. God knew he was still beating up, beating himself up over his failure, but he also heard reports of an encounter with a resident when he should have been resting. God looked at Jean. He had the Templar cross on a pendant which hung loosely around his neck, and he wore archaic uh, clothes that resembled old rags. A slightly uh, stained white cloth shirt brown pants with a strand of rope thread through the rim. Along his side, loosely hung the hilt of a, of a sword, his weapon of choice. Surprisingly, his cape and chain mill shirt, shirt were missing. Now he looks ordinary, unusual for someone like Jean. Bonjour, Mr. Lord. Uh, Jean wins as he uh, kneeled to show his respect. Before he took a deep breath, and continued, I am ready to be sent down to hell to continue your mission. Why would he want to go back? God asked, confused. I haven't found De Lilith, that demon got in the way that fills our Bhutan. Uh, Jean spat on the ground as he uh, spoke. God laughed. He had grown uh, to appreciate Jean's liberty with swearing and medieval French. Jean knew almost every exist language in existence, so he understands that fills our Bhutan means sons of, sons of a bitch, essentially. At one point, however, when Jean uh, learned who God was, he was as polite and well-mannered as a stereotypical churchgoer. The fact that Jean was so comfortable in speaking near God uh, showed how far he had come since they uh, first met 800 years ago. Jean had a slight uh, look of pleasure, pleasure from God's response, but God decided to divert the conversation back to the initial topic. I don't want you to go to hell again. Your report made me realize I was wrong. We can't find Lilith by exploring hell. We need to use different measures. You were wrong? No. John said it sarcastically. Yes, I was wrong. I'm not perfect. God froze his brows in annoyance. What's this? I, what's this I hear of you arguing with that woman again? John gave uh, God an apologetic look. I just wanted to apologize. God gave uh, uh, John a solemn look. At his core, John was a good, loyal well, man, but he was plagued with the mistakes of his past. From his time serving as a Templar of the Crusades, there were many wars on earth that God frowned upon, but he never liked the Crusades for what it stood for. He felt that there should never have been a war motivated by religion. To say, I am doing this in the name of God was a phrase that God never liked. The people that justified their actions by saying that God told them to do it or that they are doing God's work were intolerable in God's eyes. Though John represented a group of the Crusades that God personally did not care for, he recognized that Jean was different. He so regretted his actions that when deciding whether to kill a group of innocent civilians 
Horton faced an execution from his captain for treason. He chose the third option, killing himself over an excess of guilt. You need to let it go, Jean, God started. If you didn't deserve to be in heaven, you wouldn't be here. You are a good man. John's eyebrows furrowed as he looked at God in confusion. Good man? What the hell do you mean by good, God? I was responsible for Maya's death. Meredith. The actions I took as a Templar are unforgivable. You told me long ago that I was brought into heaven because I regretted my actions. But I Putin did burn someone alive. So this uh, essentially means I effing burn someone alive is using another slur. Uh, God recognized her words as being more colorful profanity, but he ignored it. God watched as John's uh, shoulders began to shake as he winced in pain, and blood started to seep through his shirt. I may have been content at the beginning, but now I'm reminded of my actions every day. I don't deserve to be here. I deserve to be in hell. Have it all reminded me of that in our fight. God hugged John gingerly, careful not to uh, hurt his bleeding wound. He had a musty smell of sweat and dirt as God held him. John cried uh, his, uh, into his shoulder uncontrollably. You need to learn to forgive yourself. I have forgiven you long ago. You regretted your actions. You are not a bad person. God felt John uh, shake his uh, head before he stepped back to face him. I don't know if I can. Go to the hospital. I know you didn't. Get healed up. I may need you to return to hell on a rescue mission soon. God held his hand up, his hand uh, glowing in a bright golden light as a portal opened to SH's hospital. He said rescue. Who got captured? God turned uh, toward the staircase up to the front door and ascended as he spoke. No one, but someone may be captured in the future. You need to be ready. God heard the portal close and he turned to see uh, Jean was uh, gone. He then resumed his ascent and approached the door. God knocked on the door, but the door gave away and uh, creaked open, exposing the dimly lit interior with a smoky atmosphere that smelled of incense and apples. God cautiously entered and looked around. The room was partially decorated and several unopened boxes lined some of the walls. In the center, though, was a large couch with a silver haired man smoking a hookah. That was the origin of the apple smell. On the table were small vases uh, with lit incense bunches, likely used to balance out the uh, smell but only served to overwhelm the senses. The man himself had a thin beard that encircled his mouth, he, and he had uh, short gray hair. From his uh, back stretched uh, large white wings that hung over the uh, back of the couch. Behind him, though, was a wood panel floor and a glass opening that displayed the uh, view of the city of Astasia, one of the twin capitals of heaven. Uh, I just lost my place, uh, which uh, looked small on the horizon. God could see a small table on the floor with two chairs on either side, but the one in the back towards the right wall was blocked by a curtain draped in front of it. God could tell that someone was sitting there as he could see plumes of brown, uh, smoke blown into the air. Hello, Proviel, uh, God murmured as a gray-haired man, Proviel sat up. He was dressed in a long robe that extended to his feet. Jehovah, or should I say, God, what do I owe the pleasure? God, uh, Proviel put on an innocent face as he put the hookah pipe to his mouth, inhaled deeply, and exhaled. You know, something interesting uh, happened uh, when we were doing interviews for the position of elder. I ran into an interviewer, Ezekiel Graham, who knew my name. I transformed into his elder persona, a long beard formed, and he, uh, and he stood straight with his hands on his hips. Many people know your name. Wasn't Jehovah referenced in the Bible humans are always reading? Proviel was still playing innocent. God began to pace. He was getting frustrated. Proviel could play innocent all he wanted, but God was sure he knew something. Glass gaze turned toward the window with the chair blocked by the curtain. He saw an ashtray being pull uh, pushed up to the table with a cigar placed on it. The dark-skinned hand was exposed, with the dark skin ending at the wrist and turning into a white forearm. God excelled deeply with the knowledge that he was right. He faced Proviel and glared at him, uh, eyebrows furrowed. He called me Bright One, Prov. Only 11 people are out there that know that title, and I know the location of all but one. Your protector, Raphael. I know he is here. I know he is Xenio Graham. The room erupted into laughter from Proviol as a hidden uh, and the hidden figure in the back. The person in the back stood up and stepped in the open, revealing himself to be the figure of Ezekiel Graham as he appeared in the interview, with mismatched body parts and, a, and an imperfect smile. 
Ezekiel put his hand in the pocket but drew a small round golden device with the blue light. Cloud recognized it as being the invention of his colleague Uriel, the device made to change someone's physical appearance. Ezekiel flipped the switch and the facade dropped. The mismatch horn began to dissipate revealing the figure uh, God knew all too well, Raphael. Raphael had long flowing black brown hair with bright red, red rings uh, stretching from his back. He was dressed in uh, dark blue jeans with a t-shirt that read, Too Young to Die. Cloud smiled after reading the shirt. Raphael was the youngest of the eighth year, his people. It's funny how that was the shirt he wore. But it gave me away, Raphael now he quoted the perfect smile and grinned widely. You always had a flair for the dramatic. How you portray yourself as equal grandma is exactly how you would portray yourself thousands of years ago. You never change. God laughed silently. He didn't realize he missed him as much as he did until Raphael stood right before him. Was any bit of your resume real? I did go to Oxford, just not with the name of Ezekiel Graham, and it dropped out. I'm not as smart as you, Jehovah. God's smile faded, and he turned from his elder persona into his regular persona. The gray beard shortened and formed his patchy brown beard, and his robe turned into a white suit with a blue shirt. Don't, do not call me that. I haven't been Jehovah for a long time. Tavio and Raphael exchanged glances before facing God with a look of concern. Fabriel stated, you can't keep running for your past, Jehovah. Sure, what you did was wrong, but it's not right to friend that pretend it didn't happen. Your actions led to a war within our people. The only reason you won was because you had brought Michael on your side. But that doesn't make what you did right. At the end of the day, the reason why you have this conflict with demons is because you banished Samael and turned your back on him. You did this, Jehovah. God grew short of breath as he turned into his child persona. His suit replaced with a t-shirt and jeans. Memory is up as past against reserve as memory to try to pass. Remember the scattered disconnect to please up his colleagues as he panicked. Are you just going to turn your back on him? The voice within God's uh, mind spoke up. He was only doing what you asked. You told him that he needed to find a way to experiment with his discovery, and you banished him for it? Another responded, the primitive, This primitive species barely understands the concept of using tools. Why are you choosing to ban some of my own for experimenting on them? They don't care. God's memories of his past surface clear as day. He remembered seeing his close friend Samael infusing a permanent version of humanity with a fragment of darkness. A power that Samael created. Power that all demons today possess. God watched as a primitive human, human began to seize and ru God rushed in to try and stabilize the human. God was almost unsuccessful and when the uh, crisis was averted, God made the decision to ban Samael to a realm that uh, Fabio created. A decision that God felt was just. It led to half of his colleagues to turn against him. He remembered the battle that took place. The battle that was shed, uh, the blood that was shed and the eventual banishment and or imprisonment of the traitors. Even after this battle, God saw the views of those he once uh, called friends began to shift and their relationship grow, growing distance. God realized if he didn't find a way to implement change, he may lose his friends altogether. He realized he would need to find a way to, uh, for him to be a good leader. One that wasn't marred by his past mistakes, one that was flawless and trustworthy. He abandoned his uh, old name and identity and meticulously crafted different personas to make him easily approachable. To mold him into a perfect leader, even if what he was doing was running from the past. So this scene here also changed as I started revising uh, my story is God still in my current story like God still uh banished uh Samuel for uh for uh, uh experimenting on humanity but it wasn't there wasn't a battle that took place uh more so like a disagreement that kind of led to like some people leaving heaven and uh after like seeing what happened with God and Samuel and people like choosing to leave heaven and uh, people choosing to like side with uh, Samuel. And, but what really kind of, uh, he didn't actually adopt his persona at this time. This would have been like 10,000 years ago. He actually adopted his persona a thousand years ago, like after uh, Samuel uh tried to create like the first apocalypse which was actually known as a war a desperation 
because it wasn't actually time for the apocalypse to happen. He was just so desperate for something to change that he literally gathered his strongest men and just tried to launch an assault on Earth and thus on the Hyde Agency. But it wasn't time yet, and he didn't have access to his strongest forces he would have in the apocalypse. And he he and his forces were defeated, and most of them were in prison. Some of them were killed. And uh, this event is what kind of led God to kind of adopt his persona of God and abandon his persona of Jehovah. But he realized the extent of how the battle was taking place. And he realized that he was wrong in what he was, uh, in, in his uh, beliefs, in what he was uh, doing. So this type of thing did uh, change since I started, uh, since I wrote this uh, project. But uh, it's kind of one of those things that I uh, didn't want to address. God heard Pavio's voice echo within his mind. Jehovah, no, God, shit, he is hyperventilating. Raphael, give me some water. God came too. He was face to face with Pravil and he was uh, sweating profusely. God looked around confused. Raphael gave God a cup of water and he grabbed it and took a drink greedily. I won't push you anymore, God. Your personas. You are not using them to run away. You are using them to protect yourself. Do you blame yourself for what happened? What the heck was that? God shook his head and a migraine was forming. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to remember that time. Raphael hugged God briefly before he backed off and apologized. Raphael st uh, stood up and offered his hand to help God to his feet. Still in his shell persona, Raphael walked over to sit on the couch and smoke a suga again. Plumes of alpha, uh, apple scented uh, smoke billowed from his uh, mouth. Raphael faced God and looked at him apologetically. The fact is, the leadership of heaven is crippled. I know you're planning on bringing uh, Gabriel back from the dead, but until you do that, you need, we need to establish leadership in heaven with someone we can trust. Not some uh, not some random person who barely understands her role. Let me and Pravio take on the vacant roles of elders. Let us help you, God, at least until you bring Gabriel back and find a replacement. Raphael gave uh, God a stern look. One of the reasons I came back was because I heard what happened to Gabriel. Before I learned about this, I was fully content with living my life on Earth. But Gabriel is, was my brother. The only family member that I could interact with after losing contact with everyone else after getting trapped here. Uh, God's eyes grew somber as he grated into Raphael's eyes. He saw tears being in the form of them and for a moment he was tempted to hug him. But he held back as he felt a feeling of guilt rising. Do you regret signing up to assist with our work? If you and Gabriel didn't join, you would still be with your family. We created the universe, God. So what? So what if we can't ever return home? Raphael exclaimed with an excitement, then paused before speaking. Our people were so afraid of a group of scientists that they imprisoned us in a pocket dimension. Any normal person would be dead. We turned an empty realm into an endless abyss teeming with life. As much as I miss the rest of my family, the one I found with you is worth more to me. That being said, I want to see my brother again. When you bring him back, I want to be by your side. Raphael placed his hand on uh, God's shoulder. God, I turned my back on you once before. I won't do that again. I will support you until the end. Let Raphael and I help. Heaven needs leadership restored. God turned into his normal persona and opened a portal back to Astasia. I'll think about it. Raphael and Raphael exchanged a look at watched silently as God passed through the portal and returned to his office. God believed they should know that I'll think about it is another way of saying yes. God looked around his elegant office from his laminated oak desk to his black desk chair. To his portrait of a, a Renaissance painting of Raphael by the 16th century artist Titian. Ironic. God sat down in his chair and rested his he head on his desk. While he was glad to be reunited with Raphael, who apparently had been living on Earth for the past couple thousand years, he admitted he was right. God had been using his personas to protect himself. He did blame himself. While at the time he did find the banishing of Samael was a good decision, as he felt it was wrong to witness him experimenting with on the primitive version of humanity, he could not he predict he could not have predicted the backlash he received for doing so. The amount of atheists that still resided within heaven was small. 
The others were imprisoned, went into hiding, or were banished for their betrayal. His encounter reminded him for the first time of what he was hiding from, and he knew that one day he would have to face the past, and he wouldn't have the luxury of his friends supporting him. Eventually, God will need to accept what he has done, as his loyal, loyal soldier John would have to do, and he will need to abandon the safety net he, has, he, has, he had established for himself. Eventually, he will need to be Jehovah once again. This was tomorrow's problem. Today, he needed to focus on the ha task at hand and ensure the dark future he witnessed without a glow several months ago didn't happen. So this is actually the end of the uh, my master's project. So I did kind of want to discuss is kind of like the overall response when I was developing this. I don't think I've had a single person that actually hated like any of the, these uh, sections that I tend to be revised. A lot of people were actually really interested in the world I created and wanted to know more. This is actually kind of true for uh, what I uh, put the response to what I've sent to others uh, uh, from book one. Everyone that I have shared my story with, they actually were really interested in the story and they wanted to know more. So that alone just kind of makes me uh, confident that my book will do well, assuming it's published. The other thing I want to say is I did kind of want to share an experience when I was uh, going into campus uh, for uh, my oral defense. And uh, I was stressed out the entire day. I was stressed out. I, I had a hard time sleeping. I kind of saw like a very weird thing where I saw a crow circling my car in three times before flying away. And for those uh, curious, uh, crows are actually kind of sy synonymous with death. And there's like a uh, there's like a saying like involves like the uh, patterns of three. Like if something happens uh, in patterns of three, like something bad will happen. And that wasn't the only experience that I had on my way to the uh, UPS store to print out my uh, copy of my old defense. I actually almost got into an accident three times. So uh, I literally. Three times, like, I made poor judgment calls that almost got me hit by a car. And when I did print it out and I made it to the, uh, uh, to campus, I was so terrified of the, uh, thing going poorly that when I went into the thing, I was expecting the worst. And instead, most of the things that my instructors had to say about my project or praises. Uh, there's only like maybe a couple of things that they they're more so questioning what I had written more than uh, critiquing what I had written, like criticizing what I had written. That response alone just kind of also reinforces my belief that this story will actually do well when it is eventually published. But before we kind of wrap things up for today, I did want to kind of show off the prologue. Soon as I can, which uh, seems not popping up. So this is going to be the prologue of book one. This is actually the revised version, and I, this is this prologue is only three pages long, and I'm sharing this out for the first time in public before this book is finished and, pub, and published. And I did want to share this out just for those that would be kind of interested in what uh, some more of what I've written, but uh, this you shouldn't need. To know like any other information like regarding the context most of the uh, information you see here in this prologue will be explained within this very section but th again like before I started this is a prologue of what will be book one which is almost finished uh, just finishing up the second round revisions and I'm gonna be setting it into a line editor to be uh, for the edits to be uh, finalized, and then I will be sending it, it in to be published. So again, like before I started, first section of book one. So here we go.
Prologue. Screams echo down the golden halls of the mobile headquarters of Heaven's Hide Agency. The higher investigations of demonic entities. What was once an untouchable location was now the center of an attack from unknown assailants. A white robed man frantically yelled through an intercom as a transparent giant orb rested behind him. The facility had never been under attack before, and the guards had grown lax because nothing should have been able to break through their defenses. A young man's voice wavered over the intercom. These are an entrance has been breached, and the swarm of demons is coming in from the east. A, an older man's voice came through. Demons are also coming in from the northern entrance. The robed man slams his fist down on the console and growled, Is it demons or redemos? Answer me. I'm not sure. Yeah. The young man's voice cut off. Damn it, you are supposed to be hide agents. How can this happen? The robed man scolded. Every hide agent should know that uh, two types of demons existed within hell. Beings born and created in hell, or demons, who turned into the demented creature that lived at the time. Then there were the humans sent to hell for punishment. These were known as Redemos, who were the most plentiful of the two. Redemos were the most dangerous as they tended to work in groups, whereas demons worked alone. A voice sounded from the transparent ball, a communication device used commonly by the Hyde Agency. What's going on, Sage? What happened? The rogue man was a sage, a group of people that served the role of technical support for the hide agents under their care. Whether an agent needed information or reinforcements for a mission, it was a sage's job to ensure their needs were met. Their position was typically a protected position, and it was highly unlikely for a sage to be in any danger in a normal situation, as they were often protected by the hide agency or its facilities. However, this was not a normal situation as for the first time in ages, a protected hide facility was under attack. The facility is under attack, and the sage had paused to look at the monitors, displaying the various sections of the facility, showing scenes of bloodshed and mayhem. My god, the sage droned, finally coming to terms that the once impregnable sanctuary was now under attack and overrun by redeem. The voice from the orb questioned, Who is attacking you? Shadows stretched along the golden walls, the... Uh, they, they grew larger and larger, and the only sound that came down the halls was twisted laughter. The screams of the monster victims died out. The sage was struggling to utter one word as the voice behind the orb repeated the same question with more ferocity. After the man within the ball stated the query one more time, the sage muttered one word in shock. As, this, as three silhouettes appeared outside the window, the demos. The window burst as ominous forms shone through with three prominent figures. A short man at about 5 feet 7 inches wearing a black pinstripe suit and black brown sunglasses stood in the center. On his left was a woman with fair brown hair and a black zipped up jacket with sleek black pants. Lastly, to the right, staring with pride, was a tall man with jeans, torn to the knees, wearing a cowboy hat and a black shirt. The stage screamed in fear as the student man swiftly grabbed him by the head and slammed his face in the console repeatedly, sending blood splattering everywhere. The sage was only an administrator. Combat was not in his training. Meanwhile, destruction was the only thing Dennis and Appel knew. After the seer man had his fill, he dropped the sage's broken body and turned toward the orb. The person behind him was in shock, unable to do anything but watch as the sage and sanctuary had fallen. The voice behind the ball, a uh, glowing ball, asked in a hushed tone, Who are you? The stout man stood up straight and growled, I'm Spade. The one who will bring about the end of the hide agency. Then they smashed the communication advice to pieces as a once impregnable sanctuary had fallen. And uh, that's all we are going to be discussing uh, today. Uh, before I uh, kind of wrap things up for right now, uh, I want to state that once again, I, uh, this is sort of the extract of. Uh, the project that I read earlier today is I tried to book two. The project that I uh, read uh, just now will be book one. Book one is in its final stages of revision and it will be published hopefully within the next couple months. Uh, wanted to thank uh, people watching and supporting the channel, uh, commenting uh, earlier on uh, for the support, for uh, kind of dropping in and just saying hello. And uh, with that being said, uh, 
there this is kind of the end of the series for right now i am planning on kind of having this writer's workshop uh, thing come up when my first book is published i'm gonna be kind of this series is kind of meant to kind of be sort of a guide kind of help like aspiring writers uh try and like uh just uh, try and help aspiring writers with their own writing uh when i am ready to continue the series uh uh when the skin is gonna be when my first book is published i'm gonna be opening up with uh with uh, discussing uh uh been discussing like the certain elements within like writing and so that my advice for kind of handling it so for an example is uh, one of the things i want to talk about like for this future when i'm ready to continue the series is the importance of themes uh for a novel for like a uh for like any sort of like fiction or non-fiction writer a novel and uh, so I wanted to like, make a video like discussing the themes and how you would implement them and essentially what they are. And that's uh, that's one of the topics I wanted to discuss. And there's also like different like things about like uh uh let's sort of, like conflict and different other like literary elements I wanted to discuss as well. But uh, I also want to use the series as a point to uh, analyze my own writing. So when my first book is finished. I am going to be kind of doing some character analysis. I'm going to be uh, analyzing some of my own themes present within this story. And uh, hopefully, this will kind of help me reach a different type of audience, one not really related to gaming, and one that's related to uh, writing. So it's just me trying to appeal to a different type of audience. Don't know if it will work, but we'll see. Uh, thank you for the following, uh, Stella uh, Harper. And I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you all next time.